Okay, now we are live. Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to this workshop in which we will discuss the topic of time and care under the perspective of coordination. And we, that is me, Karin Jurczyk, and that is Maria Rerich and Anna Buschmeier. Our general interest is a better understanding of the interdependencies between time and care. And I'll argue that time cannot be thought about beyond care and care not beyond its temporal dimensions. This interest is developed amidst two institutional backgrounds, which I will shortly explain before some introductory words and the two presentations will follow. The first institutional background is the Care Macht Mehr initiative group of which the three of us are members and we are the organizers of this workshop. The group was founded in 2011 by social science researchers and faculty from Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. And our aim is to draw public attention to the care crisis, which also is a feminist issue. The extent of the gendered care crisis is obvious when all fields are considered together, care and support for children, the elderly and other vulnerable groups, nursing, social work, paid and unpaid care, in institutions and in private households, related to health, to upbringing, support of family members, friends and neighbors, and much more. We regularly organize workshops on specific aspects of care in order to facilitate interdisciplinary discourse, as well as to promote exchange with civil society. We also take part in networks and discussions, give lectures, write in blogs, publish scientific te texts and carry out various activities such as celebrating the 1st of May, the traditional Labor Day in German speaking countries as the day of invisible work. And see for all that at our website of Care Macht Mehr. The second background is the German Society for Time Policy to which I belong and am active as vice president. It was founded in 2002 and we are currently celebrating our 20th birthday. This is a network of researchers and practitioners who try to bring to the fore the temporal conditions uh, prevalent in society. Our members affiliated with different institutions such as universities, schools, advanced training organizations, local authorities, non-governmental organizations, the arts, enterprises, churches, care institutions, trade unions, much more. The mission of the German Society for Time Policy as a time-related think tank is to analyze temporal conflicts to develop societal know-how on temporal conditions and the consequences for societal well-being, to bring available knowledge and know-how together, to suggest topics for in-depth analysis, to develop instruments for explicit temporal interventions and policies, and to promote public discourse in view of political and societal decision-making. Coming from these two backgrounds, it is evident that we aim not only at scientific analysis, but at political involvement. We want to intertwine time and care policies in this workshop. But now to the substance. It seems so self-evident, but what exactly is the analytical interdependency of time and care? Why do we focus on that? There are two arguments. The first is life is temporal. All life happens within time and with time as a mechanism to structure one's own action and to coordinate social activities. That includes all aspects of living, of living together and the relations between man and nature. 
the aim of care is to support all these processes of living. Life needs care. That is a so-called Lebenssorge. This is a German term from our colleague Cornelia Klinger. That includes care for interior and exterior nature, the environment and for those who belong to us. This is because every human being is autonomous as well, existentially dependent on others. In other words, everyone depends on care with all its aspects, attending to emotional and physical needs, especially as infants and children, ill and elderly people. Care does not only provide support for life, it is basic and necessary to life. As we have heard during the corona pandemic, it is so-called systematically relevant. The second argument is care needs time. Time following the logic of care with its multifaceted emotional and physical needs, limitless and repetition, situativity. It is not only the quantity of time which is relevant for care, but also the quality of time. Both quantity and quality of time are necessary to experience satisfaction, meaningfulness of one's own caring activities, and the capacity to perform care as it is needed, individually and socially. Care can only partially be speeded up rationalized and segmented and measured along the relation of time and money. Care has also to consider the needs of the care receiver, his or her own pace, rhythm, and individually required amount of care time. This is a case for care time in families, in professions, and in civil engagement. A care strategy which merely looks at formal and professional care misses relevant parts of what is required politically. So now to the second pillar of this workshop after the interdependency of care and time. We are interested not only in that interdependency, but especially in the aspect of coordination in empirical studies, it has been shown that coordinating care times is a key problem, at least as important as the mere lack of time and time poverty counted in minutes or hours per day. For us in the German Society for Time Policy, a starting point is the idea of a time policy which aims at, quotation marks, enabling everybody to participate in social and cultural life, which takes place in and beyond paid work. One crucial dimension of such a time policy is the appropriate allocation of time, meaning at the right point in time. This means that synchronization and coordination of people and action are a fundamental necessity. Focusing on care, which is multifaceted in terms of age, health status, family structure, etc. we must take into account that care systems can be extremely complex and may include many different individuals and organizations. This is especially true for family or private care, where varying family members and other individuals, as well as various professionals, professionals and organizations with their specific time needs, structures and logics come together or even more clash. And now to the last pillar of this workshop. This is even more a challenge as far as coordination is concerned since we cannot dispose of our time to the same extent. Even though the day has 24 hours for each and every one of us, there is no such thing as equally distributed time sovereignty, no equal right to time for all. We are not equal in our access to time. This is especially true in gender relations, 
which still are power relations, at least structurally shaped by the organization of labor, norms of labor and social policy provisions. We are all familiar with the numbers of the so-called gender care gap. In Germany, women work 52% more work without pay than men do. Women who care suffer from time poverty, not only from the lack of time, but from their freedom to allocate and dispose of their time, as well as a qualitative burden of time stress. The innumerous burnouts and breakdowns of mothers are a case in point, and these have been exacerbated by pandemic. The lack of professional care and care infrastructure is a crucial, but only one reason of women's time poverty. But not only are gender relations unequal. This is also the case for social class relations, including income and status. The paid care workers in and for private households are limited in their disposal of time as well. What is more, Professional care workers have more power to enforce their time schedules and needs in contrast to members of private households. But status difference are also pursued along the different status of professions themselves. Maria Rerich will go deeper into that in her presentation. These different groups are all embedded in specific time logics of their institutions. And they all need to consider time for mobility and commuting, which is structured through local infrastructure. In a nutshell, nutshell, time coordination includes much more than the individual and private challenge of negotiation. It shows the clash of the intersectional, unequal distribution of time and time sovereignty between individuals, social groups, and organizations, issues of inequality and time poverty arise whenever we ask whose needs and options are addressed and who has the power and resources to allocate their time interests. This will be shown in the following two empirical presentations. We will now listen to Maria Rerich talking about the problem of time coordination of elder care in private households, and then to Anna Buschmeier about struggling to combine care and paid work at the same place and the same time. Afterwards, we will have, hopefully, half an hour for discussion. But not to forget, I will thank very much Ariadna, Marta, and Mark from the Time Use Week uh, that they gave us this as a platform for our workshop. And now, Margie, it is your turn and you can start your presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Karin. Um, hello, my name is Maria Rerek, as you can see. And uh, first I want to tell you a little bit about my background. I am formerly a professor in, um, at the University, at Munich University um, of Applied Social Science, and um, now I'm affiliated with that university. And today I will be talking about an empirical research project that um, I did with some colleagues about care for the elderly in private households in large cities. In our case, it was Munich. And what we did there was um, care studies, um, case studies, excuse me, in households of an elderly care receiver. Um, and um, before I start, I want to give you my, here we are, can you see it? Can everybody see it? Okay, very good. Um, yeah, I want to show you oh God. the what I'm going to do today. Um, first, I want to talk about the resources for time um, in connection with care about the question who's involved, and then a little bit about time on the part of the care receiver, followed by time on the part of, um, sorry, caregiver, time on the part of care receiver, then about the coordination of time, 
the time and inequality. And finally, my conclusion and some open questions. So that's our agenda for today. Um, this is some of, um, I'm talking about this on the basis of the empirical research that um, we did. And first of all, it was very surprising to us when we saw how many people are involved in care for an elderly person. Typically, it was a number of people and our, um, we even had people um, who were being cared for by 13 other people. Now, of course, these were family members, that's to be expected. And it was not only the ones that one would expect, daughters, sons, and so on, but also um, spouses and grandchildren and siblings um, and many other family members um, that we saw. Um, number two was the professionals from various medical professions that come into the household, for instance, nur nursing services. And of course, these have various alternating employees. It's not always the same person who comes. Then physiotherapists, speech therapists, and others. And then we had the so-called informal pay paid care providers, um, cleaners, casual helpers, live-in domestic workers, and then unpaid care providers. And maybe the neighbors I have to talk about a little bit more, they were surprisingly active. Um, one, one reads a lot about how people are isolated and live all alone and don't know anybody. That was not the case in our study. We found a number of neighbors who were more than just um, a little bit involved, quite, quite often um, very intensely involved. Okay, now of course, what follows out of these many people who are involved, um, quite obviously, the more people, the more um, coordination, the more complex the coordination is. If you think of a case where you have 13 people and you have to coordinate their time, you can imagine um, how difficult that could be. Um, and as Karin has already mentioned, there is a specific logic of tasks. So you cannot simply do a schedule um, and, and say, okay, this is um, how this is going to happen. Um, just to give you an example, um, there are regular and irregular tasks that have to be done. An example for a regular task would be to provide meals at a certain time. And irregular and fle flexible tasks could be, for instance, taking um, a care receiver to the doctor, and um, you don't know when that is going to happen, how long it's going to take. And then, of course, the, the um, the fact that not every carer may or can do everything. A person who um, is from a nursing service can do um, nursing and medical things, but um, a daughter or a, a neighbor cannot do this sort of thing. So that has to be taken into consideration when you are doing a schedule, um, coordinating a schedule for care. And last but certainly not, not least, each and every um, care provider has an, another life. They are doing all sorts of things and not only caring for this elderly person and they have certain time needs and they too are of course also um, either regular or irregular. Um, just to give you an example, they have to um, take care of children. For instance, these children go to school and they have to consider that when they are allocating their time or they get sick um, just like everybody else. And we saw that um, very clearly during the pandemic, Anna will talk a little bit more about that. Um, yes, there are typical um, aspects of time on the part of the caregiver um, that you have to consider when you're um, trying to coordinate time. Um, who has time? And um, is it easy or is it stressful to coordinate time? Um, and each and every person has a different role in their life. And some people have more time, other people have more um, rigidity of time. Um, for instance, housewives have a different, um, different access to time than someone who's um, in, a, in, a, um, in a regular working situation. We found that people um, who are, for instance, who are self-employed, even though they work very long hours and perhaps more than people, who are um, gainfully employed somewhere, they in fact had less stress allocating time because they were more flexible. They were the ones deciding when do I take time and when do I do other things? Whereas people who are in a, in a regular um, employee situation, they have to um, work according to the, to the um, conditions of their, their, their workplace. Um, 
not only having time is an aspect, also making time. Um, you have to decide when do I have time? What can I do? Where can I do it? Um, and then, um, of course, another aspect is the location of care and time. It's a huge difference whether I can um, just pop in next door to um, talk to my elderly relative for 10 minutes or whether I have to um, take a bus and travel an hour to get to the household or come back again. So the, the location of care time we found is a very, um, very important aspect of um, how caregivers can um, provide time for their elderly, elderly relatives. And finally, um, agency and empower, empowerment are also an aspect. I will talk about that a little bit later. Not everyone has um, the discretion and the, and the power to say, this is when I want um, to use my time to do this and that. So the question of who is the, uh, the person who um, can actually decide when they have time is also very important. On the on the aspect on the time on the part of the care receiver, um, we have to think about the specific requirements in general and on a daily basis. Um, it's uh, it's very important when you're talking about time allocation and how do care receivers use their time to think about what are the specific things that have to be done for this person. And they can be very different depending on the quality of care that needs to be given. Just to give you an example, someone who has mobility issues, but otherwise is okay, has different requirements than someone um, in advanced stages of a disease like um, dementia or Parkinson's disease. So the specific requirements in general are very important as well as the daily requirements. It's quite typical that elderly people have good days, they have bad days. Um, what needs to be done on a good day is different from what needs to be done on a bad day. And what we found in our study, crisis situations are also very important. If someone falls and breaks their hip, has to be taken to the hospital, of course, that requires um, much more care than when everything um, is normal. So these specific requirements requirements on the part of the care receivers, also something that needs to be um, accounted for in time allocation. Another aspect um, there is time is different. Time allocation has to be different um, according to the month and the year. Some things people can still do for themselves. They can go shopping, but in the winter, um, that's no longer the case. When it's icy, someone has to help them. So time allocation um, has to take taken into, into account when is it taking place um, during the, the, um, the, the conditions in a month or in a year. And um, care time has to be given in, flex, or is either given flexible or within sudden structural conditions. Yes, and I've already mentioned the time for care needed in crisis situations. Okay, so if, if I want to um, pull all of this to get in, together, then um, time coordination must, must consider that it has to take place at the right time. And I would add to, add to that for the right length of time, in the right place, by the right person, in the right manner, according to the specifics of the particular care requirements of the specific, specific hour, day, month, and year. And so as you can see here, it's an extremely complex um, task to coordinate care um, for an elderly person and care is contingent. One of the aspects here that is important to um, consider, and here I'm referring to work by, by Moll and her colleagues, is the aspect of tinkering and time coordination. That means that care ar arrangements are not set in stone. They have to be adjusted, readjusted, and react in general and on a daily basis. And one has to consider that there is um, not only variations in care time supply and demand, but also in the value of time. Um, for instance, it's uh, a huge difference whether we're talking about um, days of the week or weekends, whether we're talking about holiday times, whether we're talking about um, uh, 
other times that have a certain value. And we see that, just to give you an example, we see that in time um, for, um, for Christmas. We found again and again in our study that it was an issue um, who is going to take care of a person at Christmas time. Um, Live-in domestic workers, for example, want to be home with their own families at Christmas. Um, families may want to spend time with their own children and not um, in nursing an elderly person. But on the other hand, an elderly person needs care 365 days a year. So the value of time is an, a, an important aspect here when you are talking about how do we coordinate it. The result of all of this is that coordination of care and care time is work. It's a task, it's a requirement, and it's also an achievement sui generis. So we found a number of important things in our study and it's hard to say what, what is the most important, but I would say that this aspect the resp responsible care coordinator is probably one of the most important aspects. We found that this does not um, just simply happen. Somebody has to have a complete overview in order to successfully coordinate and take on the task of synchronizing care for an elderly person. So this cannot be done by just one or the other person. Someone has to be um, the manager, if you if you will, to use that term, a responsible person who says, okay, I am the one who will coordinate all of these things. I will next come to the aspect of coordination of time and inequality. Um, we saw that caregivers and um, have a very different, um, different level of bargaining power for time determination. For instance, to use the example of living um, care um, givers, they have to structure their time according to the specifics that are determined by their employers. They cannot say, okay, this is my free time. This is the time when I, when I will be um, involved in caring for the person I'm caring for. They um, are not free in the way um, they allocate their time. On the other hand, nobody has the power um, to say when they are going to use their, their um, time. No individual can do that. Institutions have their own, um, their own aspects of when they, um, they can allocate time for individuals. They have more time determination power than individuals. And um, when, we're, when we think about who is, um, has less power, we find, found the classical dimensions. Karin has already mentioned gender and class. And I would add to that race and ethnicity um, involved in, in caring. Um, these were dimensions that we were expecting, but two other um, um, aspects that are um, more difficult to pinpoint and that are surprising is um, that we found that spatial aspects of time for care are very important. Um, if you have children, for example, who are caring for an elderly parent, um, of course, the child who is far away will invest less time for care than the child who lives close by. That is just um, care involves hands-on care. You have to be there. And this spatial aspect of time um, leads to time poverty perhaps for one, one daughter and um, more time for the other. The next aspect that is very important that we've found is the quality of family relations. Um, not all family relations are the same. And if you have a parent-child relationship that was always bad and another that was always um, very good, then one, um, family member will take more time usually than another family um, member to invest time to care for their elderly relative. I'm coming to my conclusion now and um, some open questions. Um, as we all know, more and more elderly people needing care are um, what we will be able to expect in the future. Um, just to give you one number, Two generations ago, um, it was typical 
that care needs were maybe three months. Today, that number has increased to seven years. That means more and more people will be needing care and they will be needing care for a longer period of time. That means that people who are caring for them will have to invest much more time than they used to in the past. And there are more and more people who cannot depend on continual support from their relatives, either while they have, don't have relatives or because their relatives live far away. And who will coordinate their care needs? Who will take on the task of bringing together the various strands of care time? So we will have new and increasing challenges for time coordination in elder care that have to be taken in, in consider consideration in social policy. Now, how will these solutions come about? They won't be um, coming via Amazon into the private households. So policymakers have to attend to these aspects and hopefully address them and come to some solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margie. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation. And um, yeah, you, you uh, named some important questions, but I beg the audience to keep them in mind. And um, I would like uh, to make Anna to give her presentation now immediately. And then we have time for discussion all together and write down your comments or your questions and then we will have time for discussion at the end. So Anna, I give you the floor and uh, yeah, all the best. Thank you very much. Um, Maria has to close her presentation so yeah. I can open mine. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Do you see the right version? <laughs> thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about um, not care for the elderly, but care more for young children. But um, if we all listen to Maria Reri's um, um, presentation, I think we will um, realize that many things work for both cases. So caring, um, and combining care and paid work at the same time and same place, and I will talk about the pandemic, um, will be maybe the same problems that people um, face that had to care for, uh, for the elderly people. But this is at the moment not my problem, but maybe we can discuss this later. Um, I would say some sentences about myself. I'm working at the German Youth Institute, um, a huge German source, um, um, social science research institute we have uh, nearly 500 uh, people working here by now and i am trying to coordinate gender research at this institute and um, in this position i did this um, this project that i'm going to talk about now um oh no sorry ah okay um as uh, Karin said in her introduction, um, she, she mentioned a care strategy which only looks at formal or professional care misses relevant parts of what policy needs um, or what is politically needed. Um, I try to start from this aspect because what we saw during the pandemic was that um, huge parts of what care is were missed out. Uh, for example, that care needs time. Um, it was very easily said that parents could go home and look after their children while they were working at the same time um, without realizing that these children might need time uh, on their own and uh, they can't just sit around and let their parents work. Um, and this is wh where we started our project from. And we, we saw and we thought before we started that ex, um, especially single parents who had to try to combine care and paid work um, had a hard struggle to do so. And that is why we put one of our focus on this, uh, this group. And with this, I will show um, which consequences it has if polity or other um, care professionals um, uh, 
forget about time that is need for care and the time equality arises by this. <clears throat> this is uh, the project we did. It was called Mothers and Fathers during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we did it in a cooperation with the German Youth Institute and um, um, uh, University. And um, it is very, um, very interesting that we could do three waves of interviews with our families, with our parents. We had a first wave of interviews in June uh, until September 2020. That was nearly directly after the first lockdown in Germany. So um, everybody still had the feeling of this was a really hard time. But it seemed to be over at that moment. So um, there was a great relief and people thought, hmm, we will see what the, the autumn might bring. But um, for the moment, it was summer vacation and many people uh, were um, looking back to hard weeks or months. Uh, we had then a second wave. This was in February and March 2021. Um, and that was when the second lockdown was happening in Germany. So many people, many, many parents were at home for uh, up to 10 weeks uh, with their children at home because there was no school at that time. Um, so they had to do the homeschooling and at the same time they had to do their paid work, which uh, in opposition to the first wave now got really uh, back to normal in a way. In the first wave, we had many, many parents who said uh, everything got uh, easier, we didn't have to work so much. But in the second wave, um, they had to work as they did before, but uh, from, from their home offices. Um, and at the same time, children were at home and had to do homeschooling. And then we could do a third wave. It was this year in May and June. Um, and in this interviews, we try to look back a bit, like, uh, what, did you, uh, what do you think about the pandemic after two years? Um, but we also try to find out what people explain to us what might have changed and will stay in this new normal. <clears throat> uh, we focused on, um, um, as I just said, single parents and those working in high leading positions, because for both groups, we expected that uh, combining work and, work and um, care needs is very hard. Um, just to let you know a little bit uh, about what happened with parents, not that's not for our parents we asked, but the um, parents on the whole. Um, we had this big um, discussions in Germany if the pandemic um, made uh, or led to a re-traditionalization. -tradi um, can we uh, see that mostly mothers did the care work or was it mostly fathers? Was it new that so many fathers did care work? And um, if you look at these numbers, you can see, you can really interpret it in both ways. Um, on the one hand, we see fathers nearly double the amount of hours um, they cared for their children, at least in the first waves. And this really changed in the second. Um, um, so we can see, fathers did a lot. Um, but what is more impressing is uh, mothers uh, even did very much more. <laughs> so the fathers um, reached about the amount what mothers did without pandemic. So um, what, what um, is obvious that uh, if you um, do care work or, chill, or look after your children, this is the care work is much more than this, um, for nearly 10 hours a day, uh, there's not much time left for uh, employment work or for other tasks and free time for sleeping or whatever. So what I want to talk about is how uh, did parents um, solve this challenge to combine working, um, paid work and care work at the same time and for many people at the same place because they had to work at home. Um, and what we now found out that there are, of course, different groups of parents. And we um, had looked at the, the single parents and we had looked at those in a relationship. And we see that those who live in a relationship have at least theoretically the possibility to divide time for paid and unpaid care work. And it's an open question, which has been looked at from many other studies um, that they, they 
some of them did and some didn't um, um, divide. Um, many fathers were, for example, working in their home office and quite undisturbed, uh, while mothers had to work uh, on the um, uh, kitchen table and children playing around them. But um, of course, it was possible, and um, especially the parents that we found where both parents work in leading positions, um, they tried to divide work by time. Um, they did in a way a shift. Uh, one works in the morning, the other one works in the afternoon, for example. Parents um, who are separated and live without a relationship. So we had those that were separated, but had a new relationship, for example, but those who have no relationship have don't have this possibility to divide tasks by time, either by time nor by, by, um, by tasks. And I will give you some examples for this. Um, we have here the example of Clara Kaufmann. She is a single mom. She works 40 hours a week. Um, she Usually her children are every second week with her husband, but this didn't, didn't work during the pandemic. Um, so she tried to really do paid and unpaid work at the same place and same time. She managed this by getting up very early, trying to work two hours before the children went out of bed. Um, then she um, woke up her sons and tried to convince them to do their um, online lessons. Um, when they were um, the first wave, they were very young. The, um, um, the younger son was, uh, I think, third or seven, uh, third or third, uh, second or third grade. And it was quite hard to get him to do his homework at all. So she had to be a very close by in her support for this. Then she said, we have to eat lunch, but this also means lunch has to be prepared. She didn't even have the possibility sometimes to go shopping because you weren't allowed to take your children to the shops. So they um, had to be alone at home or she um, tried to manage uh, to do it in the evening. And then the afternoon again, parallel working, um, this is, uh, she, she changed her home. That's what you just said about spatial things. Um, because before she didn't have two, um, two desks for the, for the sons. She had to, to, to get all this. She didn't have a printer. Um, so there, there were many tasks around this to make this possible because she said, yeah, I have my own notebook, but my children are not allowed to work on my, the notebook of my, um, my work um, while I am working. And then at nine o'clock in the evening, she fall to bed and said, everything uh, is gone. She, we have this uh, convincing um, quote, quotation of her interview. She said, I simply notice that it, this exhaustion is already there when you start at six in the morning and you simply don't have any time and you have to be 100% concentrated even after work in order to explain French grammar or whatever and what naturally wears you out. So um, here's, you see the exhaustion and what it means the same place and same time. Um, we have, on the other hand, some couples um, who, try, who tried to divide uh, care and paid work. And this is an example of uh, Michael Müller who um, uh, used to commute quite uh, for a quite long time. He was before the pandemic. He wasn't home during the week, um, but when uh, when he had to go to home office, it was in the first place very nice for him to be at home at all, uh, and to see his younger ch child, who was then like three or four months old, to see him growing up at all. To, to, he says, like, I can now be there when he turns around for the first time, when he gets awake, or all these things. With his first child, he wasn't there at all. Um, but then in the second wave, um, he, uh, you realize that he, he remains in the position of the person who's not really there for care. He is there to spend some time with the children, but he doesn't have his own tasks in caring for the children. He said the first lockdown was a disaster, but now in the second one, you've got to use to, uh, to it a little bit. Um, uh, and, this, and at this point, I can really only endorse that because I am also at home. It's also been quite a support for them. He understands himself supporting his wife with her care work. 
And that's what he um, does during all three interviews. Um, he um, appreciates to be that much at home, but that's it's not getting his involvement. It doesn't really change in care. And we have another father where you can see the opposite. He had to be, before the pandemic, he was also quite a lot away. He's working in a leading position. Um, but because his wife has a very um, uh, important job during the pandemic, she's a psychologist and working with young children, uh, she couldn't make it possible to work at home. So he uh, worked at home for a lot of most of the time um, and he he wasn't very flexible but at least he could be there if um, his daughter or daughter and son were playing in the other room sometimes and um, he was very much involved in this care work and this changed during the pandemic that's what we um, analyzed that he wasn't that much involved before but during the pandemic he really finds what it means to be there for the children and he has a lot of examples in his interview where he says uh, I have a, um, a conference and behind myself there's um, a huge mess because the children are arguing or whatever and what he always explains us is um, that's what you see here in the quotation in the end he says and uh, yes basically um, the coordination within the family has increased significantly and with it, of course, the competition between individual interests. This is something um, we find in couples where both try to combine and use this kind of shift work. They have to fight in a way for uh, whose work is more important um, and who has the, the uh, possibility to, to work in the undisturbed um, office and who has to work on the kitchen table and um, organizing the children and opening the door if it bells or whatever happens during the day. <clears throat> so um, we've found different consequences of these different strategies that people chose. And um, not very uh, surprisingly, we saw that single moms who don't have a network suffer hardest. We have many um, interviews. They tell us about their burnout, nervous breakdown, uh, mental or physical exhaustion. Um, that's um, It's not true for all of them because some they really have like grandparents or whoever helps them, but those who don't use this are really mostly um, after two years of the pandemic, they are really down. Um, for those fathers who have little or even no care duties, um, we could find that they benefit most from the um, pandemic because they enjoyed having so much time with their family. Um, they enjoyed, um, for example, many of them told us, uh, oh, I could uh, try to learn a bike, uh, the, um, driving a bike, riding a bicycle with my children, and I wouldn't have seen that otherwise. And you know, we spend so much time in the forest or whatever. And they often have a good place to work in their home office. And those parents like Norbert Nieheig, who I just mentioned, who try to combine um, share, care work and paid work in the couple, in the relationship, they found really new dimensions of being torn between two spheres and new conflicts in the partnerships arose. Uh, so we can see here that for fathers who hadn't done that before, um, it seemed to be a new dimension of being involved into care and at the same time learning what it means to be involved into care work. Mm. So, um, yeah, of course, we can now say this is uh, you should choose this or that strategy, but we found in our interviews that this is often not something people um, choose that had to do because there was just no alternative. <clears throat> um, other strategies we find um, to uh, have less time poverty, um, nearly all of them before the pandemic had very strong relationships, for example, with grandparents. And in the beginning of the pandemic, it was forbidden or not allowed, not um, meant to meet them. Um, and um, some of them, especially uh, single mothers, were very 
uh, fast with going back to their network of, of grandparents. They said it doesn't work without them. Uh, we have to go there. Uh, they have to help us. Um, and then the um, and for those who couldn't do this, new um, networks uh, often arose from from neighborhood. Many said that we hadn't done something with our, our neighbors before, but during the pandemic, we learned, uh, got to know our, our neighbors. We met in the garden. Um, we helped out with uh, looking after children so we could go shopping, for example, shopping for the grocery store, not for the nice clothes or anything. Um, so what we learned from our um, from our interviews regarding time, uh, what can help the family um, to build a network um, of institutional care of grandparents, neighbors, friends, whoever makes it possible that you have time without care um, responsibilities. Um, we also learned from some mothers and fathers, how important they felt it was to set boundaries. Uh, how do you finish your work day and start with the care work? And this is um, a very, um, we have a large variation of how people did this and how they want it. Some even found it is very nice that now you can combine it so much. And others said, I really have to make a break and put down my uh, mobile phone or whatever. Um, then we found that those parents who recognized each other's burden had um, and were able to create free time for the other parent um, ma really made um, relieved in a way the stress. And this is true for children, for parents who still live together and those who don't live together anymore. There were also ex-couples who said, um, if I am exhausted, please go take the children for a week. I can't stand it any longer. And it worked. Um, yeah, and we they all were looking for time for breaks and self-care, which was really hard to find in the in the high uh, peaks of the pandemic. So what we could discuss now um, is how could uh, time policy support families in this situation, but as we all hope, um, we don't come into this situation again, but what do we learn from this and how could family support, uh, could policy um, support families um, after the, the acute problems of the pandemic? What can we learn from this? Um, extreme examples for um, for time policy and this as we just said is has to do something with with uh, infrastructure with um, with um, uh, care infrastructure which has been closed so long in Germany as I don't think in any other country um, schools closed for nearly uh, three months or four months um, which wasn't um, wasn't possible to to um, to go along with for the parents, um, and um, that care time needs time. Care needs time. It needs time for childcare, but also for self care and for the relaxed time for the parents or for the caregivers to go on with this type of work. Okay, thank you very much, and we are looking forward for the discussion. Thank you, Anna, and thank you again, Margie, for this wonderful and well-fitting two presentations, uh, different cases, but, um, but there's much in common about the question of coordination. And um, yes, I hope very much now for comments or questions from the audience, if there are some, I will get them and I will read them to you. Otherwise, um, you can, we have now half an hour for discussion and um, you can uh, post questions to each other. So uh, maybe Margie has questions to the presentation of Anna and vice versa. And so um, let's just start and I hope someone will jump in with questions and uh, comments. So just unmute yourself and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are no questions in the chat, I would like to ask Anna a few questions. I wonder, did you somehow um, control the age of children? Because I would think that small children, young children 
require more time than, let's say, teenage children who mm. can um, structure their own time. Yeah, um, the, we, we had um, in the first wave, we said the youngest children, there had to be one young children younger than 12, because that was the usual age when all the um, policy measures started or ended. If your child is older than 12, you don't have the um, right to, for example, um, to this Kinderkranktage, this days off for sick children, for example. So on the first wave, they had all a child under 12. But of course, we found that the younger the children are, the more time they need. Um, but the homeschooling um, for the younger children, younger school children, also needed a lot of support because it was technically um, so intense. Um, you couldn't leave your children in front of the computer without um, looking after them. Um, and uh, the older the children get, and on the other hand, you some um, explained to us that the children started, um, they should do their home schooling, but they started uh, online gaming. And um, th so again, you, you had to look after them uh, in a complete different way. Mm -hmm. um, Regarding the age, we also found out that it's very, the hardest was if you have a very young child and a bit older. So if they don't play together, for example, they have completely different needs. And what we also see is um, that, of course, during this two years of the pandemic, children got older. And sometimes people tell us, and we can't analyze if, it, if it's get if the relief comes from children getting older or from getting more used to all these um, these things or from the pandemic to stop or whatever. Yeah? They just said everything is getting easier, but our child is not now three, it's five or six. or So that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. I have another question to, to you, Anna. Mm -hmm. And this uh, picks up the, the aspect of equality or inequality. Um, And I wonder if the leading position of these working parents made <clears throat> any difference. I think you have no comparison or did you have some without leading position? So, um, so what does that mean under the perspective of, of resources and, mm -hmm. and so status, social mm -hmm. class, income mm -hmm. and so on? Mm -hmm. Um, we have, um, it was either or, we have either leading position or single parents, and some are both. Um, so you can't really combine, um, you, you, we don't have a contrast in that way. Mm -hmm. But we see from uh, those mothers in leading positions um, that they are very much used to have a network of people um, supporting them with their care work because otherwise they won't be able to work like 50 hours a week or something. Mm -hmm. And for them, um, this the institutional side of this broke away, but we found they were very quick uh, in getting new people helping them, <laughs> like coming back to their grandparents, their, their parents, for example, even though it wasn't uh, officially allowed to, or um, one um, had an au pair or whatever. Um, so um, there is the difference, maybe, as you just said, in class and income, um, they were very uh, good situated people. Most of our interviewees were. Um, they had gardens and houses and uh, they didn't suffer so much from existential needs with some exceptions. Um, uh, and, and still they had these problems. So we always said, if these people are suffering so much, mm -hmm. how do the others do which don't have the time to talk to us? I mean, who has the time during the pandemic to give us an interview of one and a half hours. Mm -hmm. That's those people who are in home office and can make it an appointment <laughs> or those, um, yeah, I mean, who have a partner or whoever takes the children during this time. And so we have a very um, good situated group of people mm -hmm. and still it got very hard for them. Mm, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maji, do you have any 
And I have a question to Maji, if you ah. if you have. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, uh, I was just, it's not really a question, it's more a comment, because I was wondering, you said um, the coordination of time uh, makes it, uh, of care is, uh, is work, and it makes it very hard to combine up to 13 people. Um, at the same time, we see um, the single mothers um, who have no possibility to coordinate with anyone. Um, so there must be something like the, the turning point when it gets too much. Mm -hmm. Even some single parents say they are happy they have to do everything alone and they don't have to, um, to, uh, to discuss with anyone. They can just do it the way they want it. But um, is it the more people are involved, the easier it gets? because or is it at some point you say now it's now it's too much now the coordination takes so much time mm -hmm. well as in many things in in our study it really depends on the people and also on their attitude um i think it's very different in the in certain aspects in the case of children and in, in the case of elderly in my my idea is that if you are a mother or a father This is a responsibility that is more or less unquestionable. You know, people don't say, well, I don't want to do this and then I'm not going to do it. Whereas in our case, we certainly found people with large families. For instance, I'm thinking of one man who had six children. And at the end of the day, it was only one of the children who was responsible and who decided, okay, I'm going to coordinate this. I am responsible. I'm, and the others were sort of, well, I will help her if the need arises. So in the case of elder care, I think it's possible to say, well, I'm not going to do it, or I'm not going to do it intensively, or it's more important for me to take my vacation and so on. So it is a different level of responsibility in connection with how much time um, one is willing to allocate for elder care. Um, and then that's, that's, that's a, an important issue. In the case of mothers or fathers, um, they can't really say, well, it's none of my business. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, until now, there are no questions uh, in the chat. So I, I want to, to, to point to what I'm mostly interested in, that is the, the question of political strategies. You know, Listening to your presentations, you, you can get the impression, yeah, you have to negotiate, to have to speak one to the other and between the individuals and to make good arrangements. But um, my question is, what, what really can we do that it is not only an individual problem? And the two of you, you both uh, suggested some, some ideas. And I would like to, to come back to that. And, and firstly, Margie, to pick up what you um, said that we need a, a coordinating manager. And how, how can we imagine that? And are there any examples from other countries? I remember some of Scandinavia. And perhaps you can a bit deeper in, you can go a bit deeper into that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that political policies and it's, um, I don't know how you can do that. Maybe we can talk about that, but I think a political policy um, in this coordination um, dimension would be looking at how can we create political um, or um, how can we create institutions that somehow take on the same role as a responsible daughter or a responsible um, spouse. So. Um, How can we um, organize institutions that are available, not only in a certain um, bureaucratic way, but in a way that somehow reflects the flexibility and the specific tasks and the changing of these tasks during the day or during the week or during, because that, that is what care is all about. I don't think it would be, I mean, it could be helpful, but I don't think it will actually meet the need of people who don't have a coordinator in their, in their private network. Um, we would need some sort of strategy on the local level, definitely on the local level, um, and not even on the local level, but on the neighborhood 
level, very, very close to where these people are living. And this is how, um, for instance, nursing services are organized these days, but they have a very um, specific, specific task and they take a very small length of time when they're in a private household. It's usually not more than half an hour at most. So you need someone who's actually um, there pretty much every day and, and sort of looks and sees um, what do you need today? How are you doing? Um, and do you need anything today? Um, I'm thinking of something that I saw not in Scandinavia, but in, in England, and this was not a study, but something I saw um, informally in my own um, in my own um, family network, um, where there is a, a young man with Down syndrome who needs care. And the way they have organized that on the uh, local level is that every day there's a social worker who comes just for half an hour and says he lives by himself independently. And this social worker um, comes by every afternoon for half an hour and then says, how are you doing today? Is everything okay? Um, do you need assistance in any way? And um, this is a constant person. It's always the same person. And if, if the social worker is on holiday or, or for some reason cannot be there, there's a second person, but it's a continuity. It's um, not, you know, one day this person, the next day somebody else, and the third day again somebody else. So I think that's also a very important aspect. And I think one can take this as a type of model that you would have someone who actually comes by for a short time every day and has just has this question. What do you need? Do you need anything? Is everything okay? It's, it's like uh, I can imagine that as a social worker in a what we call a caring community. So, yes. yeah, it, and it must be institutionalized and legalized in the community with mm -hmm. and having resources mm -hmm. and being paid for that. So, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. Anna, Anna, would that help to your families? Is that, uh, is that, isn't that the third strategy for these elderly persons who need many different uh, um, professions and, and people to help them? Would that help your parents, such a coordinating manager? Mm, I don't know. I think this is a job that formerly uh, the mothers did, coordinating, managing the, the whole day. And um, of course, if, if they are not available that much for this anymore, it needs more coordination maybe in the parents' couple. And that makes it exhausting. I mean, those couples uh, that we have in our interviews with a very traditional um, organization, they suffered less. I mean, they were able because they everything was clear. They didn't have to, to argue about anything. And of course, that's more, um, um, more makes it more simple, um, but that's not what we usually <laughs> want to have. And usually, we say the more people care, the better it gets because it doesn't. Everything is not on the shoulders of just one person. But I don't. I can't imagine somebody external coming into the family trying to um, coordinate all this because, um, yeah, maybe this is not the problem they have. The problem is, uh, does everything work? Usually they have their system of the week and as long as everything works, they have a plan that it's manageable. But they all said before the pandemic, the worst thing was a child is sick. What happens? Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, this was really not the most important problem. They said, okay, now, I mean, I have the same, uh, if now a child is sick for one day, no problem. We do it in a home office, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but you know, compared to two years ago, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I really wonder what, what this could be. So I think um, it has, mm -hmm. it's not some, somebody, but it has to be very reliable systems. Um, I mean, you can't, if your child is sick, uh, ask anyone can you please come this afternoon and look after my children they won't do it I know there is this service mm -hmm. but it doesn't I can't imagine it happens if you don't know the person so I think it's um, it's more you, you have to have this network of people and they have to be um, in contact with the children regularly 
so that in case you need them, they can go there and be there alone. Um, this could be friends, family, neighbors, whoever. But I think it needs, I mean, we, we would wish this for the older people as well, that you know the person who comes, but maybe oh. an older person, I don't know, it depends on, on age and on whatever, but maybe they are more open. Mm. Okay. Anna, Anna, I think you um, turned no, off you your are unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Somebody okay. did this, it says uh -huh. to me. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, can I say something to that, Karen? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, well, from what I'm hearing, what Anna says, and from my own research, I think it could be as far as this responsible person. That's probably not so much the issue for parents. I think, mm. um, you know, parents are responsible in, in normal cases or in, in the average case, parents take on that responsibility of being there for their children and coordinating things. But basically what you're saying is create more time for the parents and especially for the mothers, right? In order to um, help the mothers do this coordination without less stress and think about what's the best solution and so on and so on. Whereas in my case with the elderly, it's not so much um, taking the time or it's, it's more about coordinating the time. How can you actually get people um, to, to um, do it at the right time in the right way and so on? And how can you um, create this responsibility from somewhere? So, yeah, th that's interesting because you see by these two, two uh, arguments, you see the huge differences between care. What, what do you mean by care? What do you speak about? What is a specific care in caring situation? So, um, yeah, we have to be very precise to, mm -hmm. to know what we, what we speak about. Mm, and that also leads to that you can't have just the one solution and that makes it so difficult for policy, I think. Um, because of course, yeah, one thing, and that's back to go, go back to time is you, we all need time for care. That's something maybe politics could change mm -hmm. about working times. What is mm -hmm. the usual time for employment work? Mm -hmm. But in the individual family, what, you can give money, of course, yeah. but what's the, the aspect of care that, that politics can give? And I think it's more the, the surrounding, the, the time and the infrastructure, and not so much the, the individual um, care, mm -hmm. except from, of course, I mean, child care institutions are very, very important. And when the first thing uh, in a pandemic is done is closing down childcare and schools. And the last thing to open is childcare and schools, then something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, the, that's the, the external care. It's not the internal family um, mm -hmm. helping system. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in a way it was very similar in the case of elder care. These mm -hmm. uh, live, in, live in carers who yeah. um, come from Poland or from Romania yeah. or from wherever they could not come to Germany um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And all of a sudden there was a huge, um, you know, there was a, all of a sudden, what are you going to do if this live-in care um, is not there? Who was the person who was there constantly? So in a way, the pandemic also affected um, the resources for elder care. But I, mm -hmm. I've just had an idea um, when we're discussing this. Um, if we talk about, for instance, help or institutional um, institutional um, settings to help care. How about if we thought about um, institutions on the neighborhood level that are not providing something that is defined by the institution, but have more of a structure where people can come to the institution and say, um, I need such and such. I need this right now, where the, the care need could be de defined by the person who needs care. And that would be an institution where social workers, whoever it is, um, could say, okay, where can we find the resources or how can we help you? Or the, there are people whose role it is to help in the certain specific situation. So that it doesn't come from, you know, from, from mm -hmm. outside, but it comes from the families themselves. And it will be very different depending on, 
on the individual family. Um, you know, somebody who has a, I don't know, a three-year-old child, but no husband will have a different need for care or someone who has a, an elderly person who is, has mobility issues, but is still okay and can organize things for his or herself. So to turn things around and not define it from outside, but define it from the, the need that is, um, that is um, coming from the family or, or the private household. What do you mm -hmm. think about an idea like that? Yeah, I, I think that goes in the direction of uh, a very wide type of family centers where you can go and ask for support and for different support. Mm -hmm. And um, and what you say is um, that, that they must then offer a huge range of, of, uh, of possibilities for supporting people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that... Um, that could help. It's just a place where people can, from the family, can come and say, we need this and that. And that is just for one week, but now we need that. So mm -hmm. that, that makes it turning around. And that's a, that's a good idea. And it comes very close, close to the specific needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, this has implications mm -hmm. for all sorts of bureaucratic aspects, like who, how can you pay for this? And how can you organize um, the payment for this sort of thing. I mean, that's a huge, huge issue mm -hmm. with anything that's being done for families or for mm -hmm. elderly people. But you know, it's we we have there are other strategies and which which already e exist. And that is, for example, the institution of time banks, where mm -hmm. where people just offer to help elder people or, or, or families and um, and they say okay I go it's it's very often without any payment it's just they say I spent time now which is open to the what is needed and then uh, in in and it's a time bank which counts that time and you receive it back later so that also could be um, an institutional solution mm -hmm. uh, on on a community level and I think we, we should develop fantasy into that direction. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I, I think the, the question of time, perhaps you know from the, the Italian example, the, they, their point is very often coordinating public times. So make the schedules of institutions, workplaces, traffic, and so on, um, make it better um, fitting together. And, um, and that is this, this, this so-called Tempi della Città, which yeah. was um, invented by women because mm -hmm. they said, okay, this opening hours of, of stores and that of doctors. And so it's also different, it doesn't fit together. And so, that is another strategy. I think it's 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 just the coordinating public times and make a, um, a schedule on the on the level of the community, um, and that exists in in Italy, and they have uh, it, it is legally um, grounded. So okay. they have to make a, a plan how these um, offers from the community can be brought together on a temporal. Uh, level and I think this also it doesn't help also within the family I think Anna it's only for your families it's only a small solution and it's not a solution under pandemic uh, circumstances I think mm -hmm. um, but it, it could be one one aspect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's um I know a, a friend who tried to offer something like a, it was called um, mother's um, like a concierge. Um, so mm -hmm. you can you you can you can pay for it, and then you have somebody who coordinates all these things for you, like making oh. doctor's appointments, filling in the forms for the Elternzeitantrag, whatever. But that's um, that's not for the say normal people <laughs> because it's very expensive. Um, yeah. And I, I was just wondering, I don't know what they do, but in in Munich you have this um, Alten Service Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what is uh, what do they do? Is this a place like what you just yes. said? No, what they do um, is that they um, they can counsel people. They tell people what resources are already there. 
Mm-hmm. So if you go there and 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 um, they will talk to you and they will say, okay, in your case, you need this nursing okay. service, you need that, and so on and so on. But they don't actually um, talk about how does all of this fit together. Okay, okay. It's the family has to do the research. They have to somehow fit that into the their own time and the the elderly mm-hmm. person's time. So they also are basically a very very good um, counseling service. You have mm-hmm. everything with one with one um, session with the person who's in charge, they know exactly what's available on a, on a, on a um, institutional level, but the coordination has to take place by somebody else. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they're not reactive. You can't say, okay, I have this problem. Can you send somebody? Yeah? They, mm-hmm. they just don't do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, another thing that occurs to me, and this also has to do with spatial things. Um, I think what would be a huge help would be, to somehow organize um, living conditions. We found that people Mm -hmm. who are living right next door find it much easier to coordinate things. They find it much easier to react in a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. They find it much easier to just take 10 minutes to see if everything's okay than people who live on the other side of town and have to travel for an hour to get to, to the elderly person's um, home to see what's what and I don't know I mean this has been talked about I think for 30 years or 40 years but maybe it's time to do something about that because um, that would make things much much easier to coordinate time in in elder care yeah that that's a good that's really a good point and it's not only for elder care it's also it's for all who need care and um, and support and this I think these how we normally live in these uh, family households, which are very limited and and separated from each other. And then the relatives are at another place. And so I think we really should push new forms of of living together and and build new types of community. And Anna, perhaps you can tell us something about your experiences (laughs) because you live in such a type of, of new living together as a community with private um, uh, cores, but can you just tell us mm-hmm. a little yeah. bit about that? That, it, that? it helps a lot. I mean, my life as we live it wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be able to do all what we usually do without having neighbors who take home our children after school and our children can just go there or can be home alone knowing some apartments next door there is somebody just in case they need somebody um and that's we we live in a house uh with um 27 um not families but 27 parties and uh, most of them are families with quite young children and um, this makes it so much easier because the children can just spend their time together outside uh, without 27 parents have to having to look after them but it's okay if just two or three go out and have a look um, and I think this is really um, something I hadn't expect before we moved there um, that it's so important and so such a big help. But um, at, on the other side, it also needs um, a lot of coordination and yeah. um, time to live in a house like this because you have to organize all this. Um, and um, it's an extra job sometimes. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really... Um, I mean, we we are all about the same age, let's say 10 years in difference, but uh, we will see what it's like if we all have teenagers and then if we all get old there, mm-hmm. um, I don't know uh, <laughs> what, it's, what this will be, but um, I can only um, recommend this type of living together. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. We have a comment from Janine Thiel, and she says, thank you a lot. It was a great input, so I give that to you. Oh. <laughs> and, thank you. And, and I think if we will further discuss these, these items, we will not stop it when this workshop ends. And I think what we can take home is, is uh, at least four points which I noted. It is the 
coordinating public times, as in Italy, the, 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 the public times on a systemic level of infrastructure, the new forms of living together, and the support through time banks, and the coordinator or coordination manager, what you brought in, Margie. And these are four perspectives which need need being supported by on the political level. It's all, uh, most of it needs money and resources. So it, it should be brought on the community level as, as uh, possibilities of uh, yeah, finding solutions for what we discussed about coordination, time and care. And um, there are no more questions and no more comments and um, do you have some then please now um, take the word Anna and Maggi. Well what I've learned from this session is um, that we can think about um, things I, I don't think we will find solutions but we will we'll be able to think about um, structures of assistance if we actually think about the variations of um, the care needs. If we if we don't just try to find one size fits all political measures, but if we think about what could actually um, address the fact that the needs are very specific and will be um, changing in time, as Anna said, different for small children, different for teenagers, and in my case, um, different for somebody who has this problem or somebody who has that problem. And I think the resources are, are there. I think they are there. And sometimes it's a question of reorganizing structures of assistance. The money I think is there, but I think the money is sometimes allocated in the wrong way or not so, so much the way people actually need what mm. they could get. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And I, I would like to add what Anna mentioned. And uh, this is always necessary, not in your case that much, uh, Maria. Mm, but it is that we need more time for care if we, if in our specific case, want to have it. It's, it's not an obligation, but it is many, many, in many families, many care situations that we have to, to put uh, caring needs in the background and not in the foreground. So it is always a question uh, struggling between working times and, and private care times. And it should be uh, um, more, more rights to time and optional time for care. And I think this is really needed anyway. So this is my, my conclusion remark. And um, I would like to thank you very much and to say goodbye to, to everybody. And thank you so much, Margie and Anna. And this is now the end of our workshop. Thank you. And thank you again to Barcelona and to the team and owner who supported us. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.